they feel real comfortable in that space and real comfortable with their skills. And so how do we do all these things and still um, do what we're trying to do with some of these community projects? We've done things through Mike McElney for quite some time, helping out fire stations, helping out police stations, et cetera. We get requests on a regular basis. And most recently, we've been given a request from a group that deals with the elementary schools in the uh, eastern, eastern part of downtown where they would like to, because the schools have been closed, have little free libraries built. They're basically freestanding um, boxes with a door on the front where people contribute books and take books. And they said the kids in the community have not been able to go to the libraries or to schools and they wanted to have some of these being made. They had the cooperation of elementary schools and the principals, they could take care of all the approvals, et cetera. They could even stock these things with books, but they couldn't make the little free libraries. Well, Jim, uh, said, hey, I could help out with that. He's got this process. It's a process which, you know, we end up clearing a few hours on a Tuesday, hopefully at some point, a little, another time when weekend warriors can come in and help out as well. But where we have a general design guide, lots of basic building pieces, like the uh, blanks that we'd use for uh, just building a little free library. And then he is there to add some guidance. People know what the design is, how it goes assembled. They have a, a design example that's been built. You can see it right now in the bench room, for instance, in the front right corner is a prototype that Jim built. And people would come in and they would build these things. We already have funding to do this. We as a group will get together. There's community that's being built in the relationships that are formed when we're all in the shop together. We'll be increasing our skills as woodworkers. Mm -hmm. And to me, it's really important. We'll be doing some good for the community. So I know that uh, this came up and Paul Duffield said, hey, I'd like to be a part of that. And then we had um, uh, Perry Crutchfield say, that's something I'd like to get involved in. And the idea here is that if we can do it for little free libraries and we get this little engine going that can do group builds for good purpose, then maybe there are other things. And for instance, we've already had a request from a charter school called the O'Farrell School. They have about 185 kids who it's low income and they don't have very big houses, but they don't have any place to study at home. And so we've gone through this design exercise, again, using a special interest group, uh, using our design special interest group that is run by uh, Tim Peachy. And they've come up with a beautiful design of a collapsible desk and it, it folds up. They're building a prototype right now. And uh, with that, then if we can figure out issues, and I'll tell you what those issues are still, the general set of issues, if we can figure out those issues, then we can take on that as another project. And we've also been approached, uh, I guess it wasn't they approached us, but Jeff Romek approached his church, which is called the North Coast Church, who is always being inundated with requests for help. And uh, they're fine with funding projects, but they don't necessarily have the means by which to deliver on those projects. Well, as long as we're doing things that we're good at, the woodworking in a facility that we have access to and the funding is taken care of uh, and we can feel good about what we're accomplishing, then maybe we can be adding these things in. Nobody knows if this is gonna become a general program or not for two very big reasons, actually three. The biggest one is people have to enjoy doing it. If they don't enjoy doing it, then there's no reason for us to even try to do it. But if this is fun and people wanna get together and do projects together, and also make some good happen, then they can participate. The other two where we've been looking into the insurance issues on this, uh, we, now, we so far think we're covered, but I still need to talk to our broker to get better uh, confirmation on that. And secondly, we don't wanna tread into uh, liabilities that have to do with things we shouldn't do because we're contracting. I need to talk to some nonprofits who do this sort of thing to figure out how they cover that. Well, let's assume there are issues that we need to deal with. The hope would be that we could get a little engine that can just at the right level of activity, harness our woodwork, woodworking skills and help us to do good things for different communities. And uh, the first instance of that is the little free libraries. We're getting together on April 6th in the shop for about uh, five hours. And we're gonna build two of these little free libraries and we'll iterate on that design to improve upon it and uh, we'll see where it goes from there. But I think Dallas wanted me to just share with you this concept and where we stand on it. And frankly, as you talk to people and they are people who are saying things that make you think they might be interested in knowing about this sort of thing, 
uh, to let them know that this is a program we're testing and hopefully eventually then are implementing and we can just do more good because it will be fun and we'll grow our skills. So that's pretty much it, Alice. I just wanted to share that with folks. Thank you, Travis. Thank you. Um, Gary, you're up next. Uh, you, you said you wanted to scare, uh, share a screen? Uh, yeah. Travis, did you want to mention the upcoming general meeting or are you? I know, if you wouldn't mind. Go ahead. Oh, okay, I will. Um, so the upcoming general meeting is with uh, George Von Driska. Uh, we had him about a year, year and a half ago. And this time he's gonna be talking about epoxy for woodworking. Um, it's been a topic that several people have been asking about. And so we're uh, including it as the next general meeting topic, but to leverage the fact that he's doing that, uh, we've been working with Mike McElney to put together an epoxy class. It's gonna be a two day class. It will include building three projects. Uh, people will walk away from it with a kit with basic things like mica powders and stirring rods and containers to mix A and B epoxy, all sorts of stuff. It'll be really good, but George will help us set the stage for kicking that off. And then hopefully we'll have a whole series of classes after that uh, where people can build. I think our primary project, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, Mike, but our primary project is going to be a epoxy uh, well, it's, a, it's a wood slab made to be the face of a clock. And we'll be using epoxy because he's chosen all sorts of interesting woods with cracks and gouges and things like that. Uh, there will be two other projects as well, but that's the big one is the uh, clock face with the clock mechanism. And uh, it should be the, the complete thing over the course of two days. So George Von Driscoll, uh, at the end of the month, I think it's the 31st, and we should see more information on that from um, uh, Mike Lewis. And uh, it came out in the general newsletter as well that hopefully you folks have all seen. Anyhow, Gary, thank you. You bet. Well, good afternoon, everyone. And uh, uh, welcome to the meeting. It's always a pleasure for me to, to sit through this meeting. I always enjoy coming on early and watching everybody click in because every time I see a, a different face, it reminds me of all of the different things that each of you have done to help make this shop so successful. I did a, a shop tour with a, a friend of uh, David Wiseman's this week who he brought in and wanted to see the shop and told them all about what we're doing. And he asked a question that I get a lot and that is, uh, what's the key to your success? Well, how have you managed to build what you guys have built here? And uh, I get that question a lot. So it's very easy for me to answer because I've thought a lot about it and I tell them that it's, for whatever reason, we have been blessed with a group of people that are just really special people in this shop. Uh, they're all people dedicated to the same belief that if we work together and, and work at it and contribute our times and our respective skills and levels of expertise, we really can put together something special. And I think all of us yeah. recognize that we have well. done just that. Yeah, but these meetings to me are a meeting with a subset of the very best of that very special group of people. And uh, I just never want to miss the opportunity to tell you how much Dallas and I both appreciate all that you do for us. Uh, you are the engine of the shop. You're the ones that keep it running daily. And, and we believe me, we don't take that for granted. So anyway, let me cover very quickly some uh, points of information that we want you to have. It's it's important for you to remember that unlike most of the people on this call who get information on what's going on in the shop from a variety of sources, most of the members that come into the shop have one source of information and it's you. It's the shift supervisor kind of is the shop to that member. And so we, uh, it might seem like we spend a lot of time talking to you in these meetings, but one of the reasons is just that, that we want you to know what's going on and have the details of all of the different things that are taking place so that you can intelligently share that with, with our members. So I wanna talk first of all, uh, briefly about the holiday gift sale and volunteerism because they kind of go together. Uh, Friday, we had the first, uh, we've been having holiday gift sale meetings regularly even through COVID uh, via Zoom. Uh, but Friday, we had the first one where we actually had it in the shop. And it was kind of a hybrid meeting because we still did a Zoom meeting for those people that wanted to stay home and participate via Zoom. But uh, we actually had nine people show up at the shop and uh, it went very smoothly. Uh, I think I think all nine were members of the Double Shot Club. So it was a, 
uh, pretty relaxed and uh, pretty excited to see the old group again because it, it's always been a fun event. And it's nice to see us finally see signs of starting to return to normalcy and be able to do the, the things that uh, we haven't been able to do and that we miss. And I'm pleased to report the holiday gift sales off to a great start already. Um, we've got just an incredible number of different things being made by a, a wide variety of people. Um, so all is well on that front, but I did want to mention that we're doing something different this year. We call it Operation Mother's Day. Um, and we're going to use a, a new resource that uh, we've uh, come by in the form of our online store that we tried just after the holiday gift sale in November. And as you may recall, it was very successful. We sold an additional $3,000 worth of merchandise um, uh, at that time. And so uh, Travis, who has been the, the uh, driving force behind this concept to begin with, continues to challenge all of us to look for ways to use this resource to, to uh, support uh, the shop in different ways. And it occurred to us that we probably don't need to wait uh, for just a once a year event to sell uh, some of the gifts that we make. And so we decided to try another holiday event and we thought about Valentine's Day, but we thought about that about a week before Valentine's Day. So that wasn't practical. So we picked Mother's Day as the first uh, next holiday opportunity that we thought this might work on. So we're going to reopen the online store for Mother's Day. And we'll be opening it up a couple of weeks prior to Mother's Day uh, for people to do their shopping. It will um, offer a, a smaller group of items than we have at, at the Christmas uh, holiday gift sale, as you might imagine. Uh, and it will be, try most of the things will be oriented toward things that you might want to uh, purchase for Mother's Day and for your mother or um, uh, that event. But uh, it will be an interesting experiment to see again if we can use this online store on an ongoing basis for who knows what variety of reasons. Uh, so we're well in, the, in on the way to planning that event. It's coming very quickly, but uh, we are uh, working toward making up some gift items to put in that. If anybody has any to donate, we gratefully accept those. Uh, but I want you to be aware that that's coming and there'll be more communications on that coming out very quickly. Um, the big need that we have right now, uh, both for the benefit of the shop in general, but also for the, the success of continued success of the holiday gift sale is we really need a new special projects manager. Uh, Doug Lesnar obviously has left us, even though he still participates in the meetings and, and, uh, and supports us in a variety of ways. We need somebody to run this function. I'm trying to do it uh, and not doing a very good job um, for probably a variety of reasons, but for no other reason, just because I got a lot of other things I'm also trying to do. So it's critical that we find somebody to take over that position. And uh, it's not just that position. We continue to have a... Uh, unquenchable thirst for more volunteers. And uh, obviously I'm not trying to uh, recruit anybody on this call because you're already doing more than your share, but through you, hopefully we can uh, identify uh, somebody to take on this position or at least become a key part of the holiday gift sale uh, operation because uh, we really need to get that slot filled to, to keep the, the momentum going. Um, volunteerism and the, the importance of engaging members and participating in the operation of their shop uh, is not a priority of the month. It's not something that, uh, you know, we just bring up once in a while on the call and then go out and do and then forget about it. It's got to be a, a mindset. So we'll continue to bring this up and encourage you through, again, because you have the most interaction with our members to do everything you can to engage people engage our members and encourage them to become more involved. And it doesn't have to be a special projects manager. It can be something very simple and, and more on an introductory level. But we really need your help in uh, encouraging members to get involved and help uh, us all carry the load. Um, one of the things that uh, uh, came up at the last meeting was uh, uh, that Somebody suggested that it would be a good idea to, um, Dallas, I'm gonna ask you to turn on screen sharing if you would. 
it's it should be available to you okay it says no you can need to go to security hit the security tab I thought I had that checked, but it shows it's checked, Gary. There we go. Now, now we're logging. Anyway, I apologize for not doing this sooner, but I finally got this put together. And it's just, a, uh, as was suggested by one of you, a tool to have sitting in the bench room that um, people can kind of see and focus on. And when you see somebody reading it, gives you the opportunity to walk up to them and say, you know, have you thought about getting involved in the helping us with the operation of the shop and, and uh, I'll let you read the sign on your own and, and uh, use it as you will. But if there are other tools or other things we can do to help you engage members and becoming more involved in the operation of the shop, please let us know because uh, that's a critical part of what we do for now. Did you see that sign? Did that ever show up? It's not coming up, Gary. All right. Ah, no. There, I'll bet now it's up. There you go. Such a handsome sign. I wouldn't want anybody to mention that. <laughs> uh, as you can see, it, it suggests three different ways they can get involved. Uh, one of the things that uh, Mary Russo has started doing, and it's working extremely effectively for her, deceptively obvious and simple if you think about it, but uh, when she sees somebody in the shop building something, she goes up to them and engages them and talks about it and compliments them on it and then asks if they'd consider building another one for the holiday gift set. And I'll let her chime in here, but uh, to hear her tell it, she's had remarkable success. And a number of people said, yeah, sure, I could do that. Mary, anything you'd add to that? I don't really have anything to add to that. <laughs> okay. And then obviously another way they can participate is in our group builds that we have every other Friday. Um, and then of course there's you know a long list of other things that they can do to volunteer. But anything you can do to help us engage more members in doing that would be much appreciated. Let me mention that, remind people that there is a volunteer bulletin board in the shop. And among the things posted there is a roster of everybody who is helping out in every capacity now and the job openings. Sharon, just so that everybody knows, where exactly is that, which bulletin board is that? Where is it located? Um, right next to your office. So in the library. Okay, very good. All right. Is it where the name tags used to be? Got it. Uh, yes, it is. Okay. Okay. Well, I don't know how to unengage in screen sharing, so I don't know what you're looking at now. But... We're looking at part of the lathes, and the, I think we're seeing your screen. We got feathers. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, we'll get we'll get to the to the lathe in a minute. Um, but before I leave that, um, any questions on volunteerism or how you can help with that? Okay, let's talk about sponsors. Uh, as many of you have heard me talk, I, I have a firm belief that one of our responsibilities as board members of SDFWA is to find ways to continue to build the value of our SDFWA membership. And one of the ways that I think we can do that is to continue to add sponsors. And uh, this uh, next Wednesday night, not this Wednesday night, but the following Wednesday night, the general meeting will be, will be announcing the addition of three additional sponsors. And again, I wanted to uh, uh, tip you off to what they are so that you can talk about it because you probably have some questions about it. Uh, the first one is actually a, uh, a garage door company. Now, some of you are probably sitting there thinking, well, what the hell does a garage door company have to do with woodworking? And uh, that's a fair question. Uh, they approached us and they offered us $500 to be listed as a sponsor on our website. Well, frankly, I'm not sure that they need to have much to do with woodworking if they're willing to pay us $500 for a, type, <laughs> a line of type on our website. But as it turns out, uh, they're, they're a very reputable company. They have a wonderful product. They're out in Lakeside and uh, they'll offer discounts to our members and they will pay us $500 a year to be a sponsor. So uh, we're gonna give it a whirl and see what happens. And there's, I think there's really no downside. So we're gonna try. 
Mary, were you trying to show a, a slide with that? I'm, I'm coming up to that. Oh, okay. I, I, can't, I can't see anything you're talking about. Okay. But I don't know how I can, how, why I can't get back to uh, the regular screen here, but whatever. Uh, anyway, uh, the next sponsor that we're, that we're adding uh, that I am excited about is Penn State Industries. Uh, if you're a turner, you're very familiar with Penn State Industries. They're one of the largest uh, turning supplies companies in the country. Um, and they have approached us and asked us to uh, work with them to form a uh, SDFWA slash Penn State club. And all of our members are welcome to become a part of that. And if you become a part of their club, you get 10% off of all of your orders automatically. It just happens automatically when you go to check out. And it's also 10% off of every item, including sale items, which is kind of nice. Um, the only catch to this uh, is that you have to opt in. And the reason you have to opt in is they want, that the part of the deal for them is they want to build their uh, marketing contact list. And so they want your uh, name, address, email address, and phone number. Now they promised us not to do anything other than use it internally. And I believe that's their intent. Uh, but we have always had a policy of not releasing that information to anybody outside of the association. So the only way to get around that is to give you the opportunity to opt in if you would like to be part of that club. So uh, all you have to do if you wanna do that is send me, email me your name, address, email address and phone number, and I will add you to that list and you'll get a confirmation email from them and you'll be able to save 10% on you know, all of the items that you order from Penn State Industries. The third one is a company called r, &R Clamps. This is a uh, uh, Wisconsin company. I think it's relatively new, probably a startup company, and they make uh, high-end heavy-duty steel clamping uh, fixtures. And um, they are going to offer 15% off of all of their products to our members. Uh, they make a very heavy duty clamp as you're looking at now. Can you see this on the screen now? We can. Okay. Uh, they have sent us uh, one of these, which is their stackable clamp system, which is kind of an interesting idea. It's kind of one of those specialty items that you're not going to use very often. But if you've ever attempted to build a set of cabinets for your home, you have found the same thing I found when I tried to do it is <laughs> it takes up a hell of a lot of space to glue up all of those doors. And uh, so this is their system for getting around that. So they've given us one of these, we'll be able to try it out in the shop. And they've asked for us to give, they've asked for us to give them feedback on it so that they can make the product better. And uh, the exciting part of this, even if you're not excited about this particular product, is this is the type of arrangement that has unlimited potential with a wide variety of suppliers and manufacturers. So we'll be asking you to encourage members to use it, and uh, particularly when they do use it, to give us feedback so we can pass it back to the manufacturer and keep this, this kind of ball rolling. We've got a similar thing happening with Norton um, sharpening stones. They, uh, they're going to donate a bunch of sharpening stones to our sharpening program that uh, um, we're putting together uh, with help from Paul Duffield. And they're also going to donate some special new stones that they've developed and some sharpening mats, a quantity of sharpening mats. So we'll be looking, and they're anxious to have our feedback on uh, those two new products that they're providing. So Lots of interesting things going on in the, the sponsorship area. Any question on, on that stuff? Okay, um, last item I wanna talk about is our new lathe program. As most of you know, the uh, turning program has been kind of a, a stepchild since we've opened the shop. We really have not done much with it until recently. Dallas and Mary Russo and a group of others have made up their minds to breathe some life into that program. And you've seen a number of things going on in the shop to do just that. Uh, but the big move forward is we're going to be adding a, a very special piece of equipment. It's called an American Beauty lathe made by a company by the name of Robust, also in Wisconsin. And uh, this item was chosen to replace the existing power matic that we have in the shop and we'll also be removing the existing Rikon because this should take the place of, of both machines. 
Um, this machine was not chosen at random. We uh, brought in some specialists from the San Diego Wood Turners and the consensus between them and us after they told us all about the various options that this is the right item. It's a $10,000 piece of equipment, if you can imagine that. Uh, but we have had some very generous members step up, including some people on this call, to contribute to a fund that is uh, put together enough funds to uh, pay for this. Uh, we will also be selling off the uh, Powermatic and Rikon to help augment the cost. Uh, there's some installation costs. Rick and, and his team are working on that while we wait for the uh, await the arrival of the machine, but it's gonna be a really special piece of equipment uh, that everybody involved in turning is very excited about. So wanted to make you aware that that's coming on down the line. If any of you have an interest in buying either the Powermatic or Rikon, be sure let Dallas and Rick know because we'll be getting rid of that. Uh, and I wanna give you the first shot out of the course if you have an interest. And again, within the next uh, probably 60 days, you should see that show up in the shop. And I'm excited about that. In conclusion, just want to thank you again for all that you do and encourage you that if there's anything either Dallas or I can do to make the job easier or do a better job of supporting it, please don't be bashful. Let us know today or grab us individually and let us know or email us. But we're always here because uh, you're very, very important to us. Thanks for listening, Dallas. Back to you. Okay. Okay, one of the other things we've got that uh, going in our uh, in the shop, actually that our shop organization that is really moving along quickly is the education program. We've all seen recently how many classes are available and how well organized they are, uh, along with the uh, the quality of the uh, the lineup, and that's largely responsible. I say almost completely responsible, the responsibility and result of the, the actions of the, uh, the leadership that uh, Scott Simpkins has brought to our education team. Just a remarkable uh, set of improvements and I'm just really excited about what we've got going on. I've asked Scott to take a few minutes here today and just kind of tell you about what's happening with the spring agenda and uh, anything else on education that uh, he, he thinks you'd be interested in. I think you'll find that that's something that uh, our members want to know more about, and we want to make sure you're in a good position to be able to answer the questions. So with that, I'll turn it over to you, Scott. All right. Thanks, Dallas. Uh, let me share my screen. I've just got a couple of slides to share with all of you, and I'm going to be looking at another screen while I'm uh, doing that. So we have um, a really nice group of people, several of whom are on this call, Dallas, Sharon, Paul, I've seen. Um, along with Elizabeth, who is our registrar, or the person who's the direct contact, she's up in the left-hand corner, um, direct contact with all of the students who are participating in the classes. Julia Cornell, who um, many of you know, just wrote a great book about SketchUp and offers that class, and we're doing it online now. Uh, we did a beta piece in the um, winter. And then we have two folks who I um, have not been able to add here. One is... Um, uh, David Weisman, who joins us every winter from Wisconsin, he just uh, asked to become part of the education team to help us develop new classes. And um, he is very excited about it, has a couple of things in mind himself. Um, so um, we're excited to have him. And then a brand new member as of December, Sandra Ken, who um, has been in the shop working on some cabinets uh, recently but she's helping us out with some promotion and communications kinds of things. So um, we have a great group of people and uh, we wouldn't be able to do this um, without you, without them. And the reason I said without you as kind of a, um, another segue is just, I wanted to say as a newer member of the association and of the member shop and a newer woodworker, how much I have appreciated um, those of you who have been shift supervisors when I've come into the shop. Um, I've gotten lots of great advice, um, lots of, uh, I would call, corrective feedback. And um, so it's been super helpful to me, and I'm very grateful for that. What I want you to know, let me see what I need to do here, um, is that if folks come and ask you about our 
offerings, the best thing to do is to refer them to our website because things are pretty clearly laid out there. Um, we've got up here on the top bar of the association website an education tab. And right below that are the words class offerings. It's actually in the dropdown. This is a uh, stagnant page, so I can't show you that. And then we've divided the classes up into four different areas, um, entry level, turning, digital classes, and skill building. The classes we have available right now, there's actually, I think, um, 13 or 14 unique classes. Um, 29 different sections are being offered. And we're actually pretty much limited to maybe a couple more that we'll be able to add because most of the interest we're finding is on Friday night through Sunday evening. Um, we do have some classes that occur during the week, um, but in terms of shop availability, as you know, um, um, shop availability on Saturday is uh, pretty filled up, but Sunday gives us a great opportunity. Many Sundays we're offering three different opportunities for classes. Um, Friday night, we've got stuff going on. And then we're also able to um, offer classes, um, you know, the laser room and the 3D printer and that sort of thing at the same time as things are going on, uh, classes going on in the shop. So entry level, we have an intro to woodworking and a workshop fundamentals, the cutting board class. And we have all the digital tools classes you can see there. Um, CNC basics was recently divided into, um, or the basics and the VCAR Pro used to sort of compete with one another and one was a much more intense, um, longer version. But now Travis and Pat have created a really nice sequence where folks take CNC basics first and then they move into um, the VCAR Pro. What we found is that people can bite off the cost of that a little bit more as well because they're, they're getting what used to be a large VCAR class. Um, they're able to do that now sort of in two um, sequences. So that's worked really nicely. And actually the VCAR class um, is full. And I think most of the CNC basics classes are as well. Turning has become very popular. We sold out the, all of the sections of basic spindle turning in like 15 minutes. And um, <laughs> we're gonna likely add another section of that Pen turning and uh, bowl turning also are popular. We still have a little bit of room there. And then skill building, we have the mortise and tenon class. Um, Paul Duffield um, is adding that hand tool sharpening class. So it's neat to hear what Norton is doing to uh, support that. But um, Paul created that class. SketchUp, as I told you, we're offering. We actually offered one section of that. But no, if anybody asks, we are going to offer a second uh, section of that likely. Julia still has not yet confirmed. Um, but that is all online. And then the small workbench class will continue. I wanted to point out that when you click on one of those buttons like entry level or skill building, there's more information behind it. And so in this um, layout, every class has a class description, the cost. And one of the things that people will probably ask you about as a shift supervisor is, do I have to be, um, you know, what's the membership requirement and that sort of thing? Um, most of the classes right now, um, with, the, with the exception of the small workbench class and likely the epoxy class, just require an association membership. Um, that's for insurance purposes. It lists the um, four hour or two days or whatever time frame, any prerequisites, and then it lists the opportunity to um, sign up and punch pass by just clicking on one of these um, links right here. If we have a class full, Elizabeth and Julia do a great job of monitoring that and typically they'll make a, a note on the website. Um, we also are running some beta classes. The intro to woodworking is now expanding um, where it's going to be a three segment um, option and we're actually weaving in some of the um, things that have been in intro to woodworking and the cutting board class. Dallas, if you want a chance to kind of share what you all are working on. Well, actually, it's a few of us work out. All the instructors, uh, uh, Tom and and uh, Paul has been somewhat involved, but uh, 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 John Wilkinson and uh, Wes and I have been working on this class. And basically, what we're doing is we're saying introduction to woodworking is is a good class, but it goes fast, and we can only teach so much during that period. So we're breaking this into two, actually three segments. The first two are going to be 
very basic. The first one will be the cutting board experience plus some uh, uh, of the uh, fundamentals of woodworking, just wood technology type training. Wood moves, the adhesive measuring, a few things like that will be covered in that first class. <clears throat> and we'll introduce them to the four basic power tools, the table saw, the, the, the uh, joiner, the planer, and the uh, miter saw. And then the second class will be kind of like our current introduction to woodworking class. And by the way, at the end of that class, they will walk away with a cutting board. Um, the, the, ne the next step in that class is the second uh, part, part B, is uh, uh, an expanded version of our current uh, introduction class, which will include a, uh, is built around the project of building a stool. And in there, they'll reinforce what they've learned with using the four basic tools, but they'll also learn band saws, sanding, working the router table. Uh, they'll be learning a few hand tools with uh, uh, chisels and uh, and uh, uh, and actually do some clamping and uh, and uh, a little bit of finishing in that class. And then the last part of this class, which I think is the most interesting, is the last segment in, in part C of the class is a, uh, we're not sure if it's going to be three, probably a four uh, session uh, segment in which they will build their own project. It's one they have to take from design to completion of a small project, maybe something built around the uh, uh, simple, some of the things that are being made in the uh, holiday workshop. Uh, other, they could build another stool if they wanted, they could build a little just, just small things. We're not talking about building a, a grandfather clock, but we're gonna learn to, they're gonna learn to do it. But we want them to take from the very conception of a project all the way to finish. And they'll be doing that with a mentor that's right there with them, helping them do it. So they'll have, they'll have uh, a person who is working with them in the shop, helping them get past all the roadblocks, but they'll be working more independently than they did in the, in the initial classes. So it's a much bigger experience. It's, it's a longer class. It's, very, it's actually uh, three parts. And um, each of those classes is, uh, first one will be two days. The next one will be, uh, uh, will be the three sessions. And then the last one will either be three or four sessions. Thank you. And so um, we have that class. We also have uh, Paul's developing right now a basic finishing class. And as you heard from Travis earlier, he and Mike are um, going to do a test run with a wood plus epoxy class as well. We do have some waitlisted classes. Um, you'll see the waitlist on the website. Um, and when we get sufficient enough interest in any of these classes, we'll um, consider offering them if the instructor is interested and uh, there's space available for those as well. So, um, I think that's about, oh, I wanted to go back. Um, when you go to this page, should you direct anybody there? That's the same page that at the bottom of the page um, where we have some of the policies. There's been um, one of the things that the group whose pictures I showed you at the beginning has been just super helpful with is clearing up things that um, you know have been challenges perhaps as we move along as anytime you're doing something new. One of those is um, around cancellation. So we have a policy that if we have classes that don't have sufficient um, enrollment within a um, one week prior to the date that we will um, cancel those. In the past, what we've been able to do is to send out another email um, to try to recruit more people. And we've actually been successful in a number of occasions doing that. If you go to the website, you'll see that most sections of most classes are actually full. We've also instituted a refund policy because there was some um, something similar to the shop slot discussion that Dallas brought up earlier where folks just didn't show up. And it's actually been super helpful. We have had a couple of occasions where folks have not been able to come and they've actually um, acknowledged the refund policy before um, we did. Um, and or, you know, they've given us sufficient time to find somebody to fill that slot. Because as you know, many of you on this call are instructors that there's a lot of preparation that goes into preparing for class. And there are a lot of people who would have liked to have attended if they had the opportunity. We actually have a number of wait lists. 
And then finally, um, we just let people know kind of how we manage the wait list. And that's actually a topic of conversation with the education team, um, wanting to make sure that people are aware um, how we do manage the wait list. And um, we're talking about some, um, some new ways of doing that going forward. So that's it. If you have questions, comments, um, I'll unshare my screen. If I can figure out where it is, there it is. Okay, thank you, Scott. Yeah. Um, let's move on down to our agenda. Um, and next up is Sharon. Sharon, you've got a few items to, to share with the group. I do, a few. Um, first of all, I wanted to talk about our new members. We had four new members in February, five new members in March. Of those, all but one was a brand new woodworker via the intro classes. Um, since we're opening up again, we're going to start taking in more new members. Um, may, maybe as many as 10 in April. But a lot of our new members, as I'm sure you've recognized, are newbies. So just be aware of that. And if you have two or three newbies on your shift, that's a lot to watch. Sharon, how many people are on the wait list? I keep lot. getting asked that. Um, I haven't counted. For, for membership, I would say, what would you think, Dallas? A hundred? No, it's more than that. Yeah, it's more than that. <laughs> That's it, 150. But yeah, Nancy would know best. Sorry, Nancy, you're on. But yeah, yeah, it's it's more than 100 for sure. I don't know the exact number, but there's a lot. So if you take the intro class, does that give you priority to become a new member? We have the, the what we've been doing for new um, for people who take the intro class. You know, we've invested time and energy in training them. So we do offer them the opportunity to, to join. Uh, they get priority for joining. That's the only class that that's true of. Huh? Okay, so then I wanted to talk about, um, oh, I guess, sorry, it's happy hour. I have to leave now. <laughs> From here, Dallas. Okay. Um, the shift supervisor staffing right now, all of our shifts are covered. So that's good news. Um, however, with things relaxing, opening up more, I suspect more of us are going to be trying to travel. So we could use additional shift supervisors. I want you to know we do have some shift supervisors who don't currently own shifts. So make a note of those in case you need to find a substitute for yourself. Obviously, if you're going to be away, the first person to contact is your partner to see if you can just do a swap. And if any of you does not know who your partner is, <laughs> send me an email and I'll tell you. But unassigned shift supervisors are Dick Huntington, and I, Dick, I think you're on this call. Is it still correct that you're available for daytime shifts? Uh, would you repeat that, please, Sharon? Um, for subbing as a shift supervisor, you're available for daytime shifts. Is that correct? Yes. OK. Um, Pat Duffy is another one. Pat, I believe you're available for most shifts time of day. I'm generally available for any shift, yeah. Okay. Uh, Rita Hanscom is not on this call, but she's generally available. Dan Gonda, do you have any restrictions? Prefer the morning and uh, daytime shifts. Okay. Um, and then Paul Schenken, is it still true that you can't do Monday mornings or Tuesday and Thursday evenings? Uh, morning, Monday morning is out, but I am available Tuesday uh, or Thursday evenings and fill okay. in 
where possible, yeah, with enough notice, that's all. Good, thank you. And then coming back on board soon will be Paul Duffield, who just, um, just got or is getting his first shot. So in about another month, he'll be ready to be, to be asked to sub also. And then of course, Rick and Dallas and I are available. But now you have the list of the people who you can ask to sub, so you don't have to contact me to say, who can I ask? Thank you. Um, also, please keep an eye out for shop members that you think would be good shift supervisors. I'm keeping a, a running list so that when the time comes that we need to train new people. Okay, next we're gonna talk about the shift supervisor duties, many of it which we've already talked about. So the change in the cleaning procedures. I'm sure you remember it used to be that it's always been that shift supervisors worked four hour shifts, even though the <coughs> shift slot time was only three hours. It used to be that they started at the same time, but then the shift supervisor would stay for an hour afterwards to do the wrap up and clean up and whatever, write your, your um, log notes. So the shift supervisor shift is still four hours. It's just that the slot shift is in the middle of that four hour period. As Dallas already mentioned, if you're there and you're ready, you can let people in to start working early, that's your call. But remember, as Dallas pointed out, that the laser slots are two hour blocks. So you might have somebody scheduled to start their laser slot. This is a tongue twister you know, half an hour before the shift starts. So you have to be there at least half an hour before your shift in order to let that laser person in to start working. Well, now, Sharon, I want to be clear on the terminology there. That's not a half an hour before your shift. Your shift starts <laughs> when the laser starts. If the shift is, if, let's just take a Monday morning. Monday, the shop, uh, the first shift starts at 11, ends at three. The laser, there's two laser slots in there from one from 11 to, to one, another one from 11, uh, from one to three. But the shift super, and then the uh, machine room, the machine slots go from 12.30 to 3.30. So it's complicated, the uh, logistics and a lot of language in there gets it. We kind of equate uh, shifts with slots. They're not all, they're not all run at the same time. You gotta remember it's a four hour, super, shift supervisor shifts are four hours and they start on the hour, end on the hour, and the most of the, uh, I think all of the, uh, the, the uh, normal machine room slots go on the half hour, that three hour block in the middle of the, of the shift supervisor shift. Thank you, yeah, it is confusing. And also during that half hour, it's a good opportunity to make a note of any supplies that you think we're running low of, or you know, just have a look around. Check the dust collector bins and do, yes. do the whole walk around. Are the CNCs uh, two hour slots as well? No, the CNC goes the same as the machine room slots. Please, when you're closing up, I want to remind you that there is a closing checklist that's by that back door even though you don't have to sign it anymore, I find it a useful double check before I leave to look at that list and see if I've remembered to do everything. Dallas and I have both noticed that the education closet and that supply closet slash bathroom in the entryway have been left unlocked more than once. So don't forget to um, ensure that those are locked. Okay, so let me just reinforce that. There's three places that are getting unlocked and not relocked. 
the hallway bathroom where we store supplies, the education closet. We're finding people finding that, thinking that's their supply room. And then the, the other one is the, uh, the garage, the store, wood storage area. Uh, all three of those should, be, should remain locked. So please, please make sure that they are. And if you have members going in there, just make sure that you know what they're doing. Uh, we're, not, we're not storing members projects within the garage anymore. Put those under the benches in the, in the bench room. But uh, uh, so just, there's not a lot of reasons for members to be going into the garage unless they previously had permission to get something for like the holiday gift sale. Uh, that's the case. We don't want them dropping, just anybody just dropping wood in there or, or doing, their, doing their thing with uh, 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 to drop, uh, making a donation with unbeknownst to any of us. Uh, that's something that needs to be approved by Gary, Rick, Sharon or I. And we want to we want to participate in that decision. What we accept to, to go into the garage. So please make sure that all three things are locked. Dallas, let me let me add a fourth one, and that's the small classroom. Uh, oh. that, that really needs to be kept locked unless there's a class going on or unless somebody has a clear need to be there. And that one generally has been locked, but not always. Yeah, it, it, we've been doing much better. First of all, congratulations on the garage because every time I've gone in there, that's been locked. So great job on that. And the small classroom usually is locked. Uh, Mary has moved a bunch of uh, equipment in there into the small classroom that needs to be secured. We will eventually be using that for holiday gift sale storage. So it's not something that can be left unlocked. We want it secured. So please uh, make sure that's locked unless it needs to be open for legitimate reasons. And we're gonna be doing classes in there again too. And the other thing is if somebody's if you've unlocked a drawer for a lathe user, you need to make sure at the end of the shift that that drawer gets locked again and it's, the equipment's been put away. And the other thing that I've noticed, Larry is not good, after he has his classes, he's not good about making sure those drawers get locked up. So I'm assuming there's a shift supervisor or somebody there who's locking up after Larry's classes. Larry's doing his own lockup now and I need to have a conversation with him about it. Please. Okay. I've emailed him. He never responds. So well, we're going to have I, a conversation. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, I have a question, kind of, kind of related to that. If if there's a CNC class or something on Saturday night after my shift, I often just leave because I just assume that it's going to be okay. Um, you should have space with the instructor just to let them know. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Just to confirm. Yeah. I would ask as a CNC or or laser instructor. Um, if the shop is closed down to the general membership, if the big garage door and the small back door were locked and closed, um, that way it'll keep people from wandering in from the street, from the backside. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. Okay, thanks for that, Nancy. Okay, I also want to remind people that you're not supposed to be working on your own projects when you're there as a shift supervisor. You know, we've talked about that and I know sometimes there's downtime and your people might all be very experienced and on autopilot, but if you're working on your own project, you're focused on it as you should be, but it really has the potential of interfering with your awareness of what's going on around you. So you can look at woodworking magazines because you can glance up from that, but working on your own project really requires, should require too much concentration. So that's just been the policy from the beginning and nothing's changed. Okay, thank you for that, Sharon. That's, we've, I've had to remind a few shift supervisors about that. I've seen it on the camera where I see, see somebody working on their own project there's just too many things that can happen. And we're going to talk about some things that have happened uh, that require your attention. We, we do not, we, we, we want to make sure we continue to have the safety record we have, let's put it that way. Uh, and, and I'm just concerned that if we start relaxing some of these things where we allow shift supervisors to not be able to split their attention amongst things, we're going to have something happen we don't uh, we'll, we will regret. 
So thanks for bringing that up, Sharon. And the last thing I want to point out is the next shop cleaning day is scheduled for Sunday, April 11th from nine till noon. It's really hard to find a space there that we can get in there and clean. But give me, feel free to give me feedback if you think that the shop isn't being cleaned often enough. That's it. Okay, thank you, Sharon. Uh, Rick? Okay, uh, I've got uh, several things to cover. The uh, tool leads is the first thing. Um, Lou Curtelini, I don't know how to say Lou's last name, Dwayne. Uh, he's agreed to be, you know, sort of own the saw blades. And we've trying to figure out how to track them and the numbering and all that. Um, just be aware, if you take a saw blade out of slot one, you know, that's fine. If you put it back dull, uh, put it back in slot one and put just blue tape over it. So it's obviously, you know, so somebody pays attention because he, he will, uh, he will gather them up periodically and get them off the frost to get them sharpened. Um, Dallas will pick them up. Uh, the, another item, Oling has agreed to help Tom with, with sanders and supplies. Thank you, Oling. So, between, between the two of them, you know, addressing supplies and and just the general, um, you know, sanding su subject in general. Um, Gerald Caps, uh, Gerald, can you make a noise? And let's show Gerald's face here. He's a new guy. He's, I'm here. Um, hey, Gerald. He's uh, helping out in a number of fronts, but one of them he's agreed to take on the router tables. So thank you. Um, on the router tables, we do have our uh, Incra lift back at Incra. They're repairing it. We have a loaner from them. And I think we're going to end up replacing the Rock Rockler one, the Rockwell one Rockler with uh, an Incra. But uh, the problem we've had with those is I think members lock them and then crank on them and basically strip out the, uh, the the locking mechanism because it's not a positive gear lock it's a friction thing and you can uh, so just keep an eye on that uh, Sean Troxel is a uh, power hand tools lead and so one of the things we're working on is the miter saw to you know uh, get the safety uh, fix the, the blade guard got replacement cart parts coming for the maintenance on that. It sort of works well, but it needs to be taken apart and sort of given a good physical and rehab. So that's on the list to get done here in the near future. Um, let's see. Tool issues. Um, any questions on, on those items from anybody? I just say I'm really pleased to get that router lift fixed. That's that's really been a, a pain when you, you you get a setting on the router and then all of a sudden it's moved on you. You 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 yeah. lost your lost your reference spot. That's a I, huge I would just ask if, if there's a way to put some kind of signing or some kind of notice near that uh, router table to make sure people understand they've got to unlock it before they start adjusting it because. I, I hate to admit it, but I've done that myself. I didn't stop to realize that there was a lock on there and I started cranking on it. And by the time I realized there was a lock, I'd put a lot of pressure on it. So we've seen okay. it. Okay, yeah, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll figure out something. Hey, good. Thank you for uh, being humble. <laughs> Is it clear when it's in the lock position? Is it clear? It, yes. Okay. Yeah, there's there's an arrow that says points right to lock. Okay. Yeah, it's, it's not ambiguous you you might not know what it means but it's not ambiguous oh. um the shop log uh please everybody it's, it's really helpful if you change a saw blade or something unusual happens uh just make an entry even though it, leave it in service you know if it's just a uh, maintenance or something you want to bring attention to because i pay close attention to those uh, and, and uh, Dallas and 
So we uh, we can just be aware of it. So, hey guys, uh, I want to reemphasize that one. That shop log really does uh, get action. It's something we pay attention to. We immediately get that information and we go through it and review to make sure things are getting cleaned up. Uh, Jim again has been good enough to give us the ability now to uh, uh, revise that so we can we can put content, uh, put information and feedback on what's been done with the items. We'll start doing that. Uh, but some of you have been a little confused by the fact when you go into the shop log that it, it requests a password. And uh, uh, that I, I, the password's not a big secret. It's our same password. It's just our our uh, SDFWA 2017, the same thing we've used for everything. So just be make sure that when you go into the shop, or you, you have something happen, put it in the shop log. If you have any questions about how to use that, Rick, I, Sharon, or other ship supervisors will all help you out on getting it in. Yeah. But documenting it uh, will help help us get uh, get things uh, put in proper working order. Yeah, and it, it really helps the tool leads, you know, uh, yeah, just sort of gives them a heads up and um, yeah, it's just a, a way to communicate without trying to find somebody on the phone or that kind of thing. Um, maybe the major top, well, two things, saw stop cartridge operations and miter gauges. Um, this is gonna turn into more than just miter gauges discussion. Um, some people, I've been under the have a, using miter gauges thinks you have to be danger close to the saw blade. You know, you don't need to be any closer than about the width of my thumb. My thumb's about one inch wide, uh, type of thing. People, uh, we've had at least at least one, maybe two operations where people try to put that gauge like a zero clearance device. Uh, don't. <laughs> Just keep an eye on people and make sure they're using it properly. Um, we're going to be developing a procedure and a, a mechanism like we did with the band saws for a while or the big aluminum ones that have been the problem. We're gonna put a cable, some kind of lock on them. So when somebody takes them out and wants to use them, you know, that's fine. We just want you to unlock it and make sure they're doing it right. Uh, that probably won't be forever, but you know, right now we've had enough uh, that it's like, okay, we just need to. I think we've had five or six instances where the the miter the miter gauge is what what did it. And almost invariably, they they took put the blade at forty five degrees and didn't didn't adjust, and that's that's yeah. where they get nailed. So yeah, you know, just pay extra attention. Um, uh, Jim Sakura and I were talking yesterday with Sharon. And I'm gonna create a, somebody suggested it, uh, Dwayne or somebody here on this call, hanging up a cartridge. Well, I'm gonna develop a display case or get developed with an activated cartridge and some of the things that have happened. You know, so it's, we have words and, and uh, visual reference and may go to the point of uh, asking people to acknowledge they've, they've uh, members acknowledge that they are aware of it you know that's uh, just that's a thought in development here that just sort of came up yesterday with the saw stop operation uh the, the cartridge operation um yeah it's just it's about 180 to 200 dollar hit every time so it's worth everybody's time to uh to uh be, it be with, with negligence, it's a member that's responsible for paying for it. So, yeah, yeah. yeah. Hey, Rick at yeah. UCS, yeah, UCSD. Um, every time somebody would not balance a rotor and wreck a centrifuge or um, all the instruments, we did the same thing in one of the labs, and it was very effective at showing what happened and what the results were, and how expensive and how damaging it can be. So, yeah. yeah. No, I just, I mean, discussions yesterday, Jim said something that triggered that thought with me. And I was like, yeah, that's a great idea. So we'll be moving forward with that. Uh, any questions on that subject? Rick, can you hear me? 
Yeah, Gerald, go ahead. Yeah, this is Gerald Caps for those that, yeah. We um, at Palomar, I was a, I've been a, vol a volunteer and a TA out there for four or five years. And when we've had the cartridges go off, we've actually dug the blades out and had them tested and they've actually been able to use them again. Have you guys thought about that or something you looked into? Yeah, we, we've typically lost one to two teeth, maybe three. Oh, really? Okay. We've never lost a tooth. Okay. We actually yeah. dug them out ourselves, me and Jim, yeah. and actually uh, checked the blades and had them sent out and they were fine. So, yeah. okay. So we, we've had, we about half of them end up being salvageable. Oh, good. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And Dwayne and I looked at one here, I don't know, the last one where Dwayne and I were together and it was like, oh, there's one. Then, yeah. It, so, okay. Um, so, Thanks everybody and uh, stay tuned on that a little bit. You know, we're gonna try to tighten that up a bit. On the plus yeah. side, they haven't been fingers, have they? Yes, I, I mean, that. this is the good good thing, you know, yeah. Um, yeah, very positive in that respect, but uh, yeah. One comment I would have is uh, uh, on the uh, shop log, I noticed that Lou's name isn't in there as far as a drop down. So if a blade's replaced or spotted as a blade is dull, I mean, we can't send a note to him. Uh, say that again. Lou, the, oh. the, the co-lead who's yeah. handling the blades, his yeah. name is not in the drop-down list. Oh, no, Lou's not? No. Go ahead, Rick. Yeah. Um, yeah, the uh, Jim, uh, can you add Lou? Well, do you need to, that's a drop down is for the person sending it, not for the person receiving it, right? It says tool lead. Oh yeah, yeah, we should get, get Lou in the drop down. Yeah. Yeah, that's two questions. He needs to get in the drop down to be attributed for, for making the entry log, the log entry. But if you want him on the table saw distribution, that's a different question as well. Yes, yes, we do. Um, send me his address and stuff. Yeah. I, 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 I'm, I'm uh, woohoo. <laughs> yeah, okay, yeah, I'll, I'll get that to you. All right, yes. Rick, yes. Rick, can I say something about the miter gauge? Please. Yeah, so the way to use the miter gauge if someone wants to make a 45 degree cut is to put it on the right side and the right. Uh, side uh, miter slot, move the fence, and then you know you have to flip the your piece upside down, and then because otherwise the blade just gets too close to the to the miter gauge. Um, you know if if you're tilting the blade and it's uh, two or three inches up from the table, is that too close? Does that make sense? Uh, not totally. It, it makes absolute sense to me, and that's the way I do it myself at home. Yes. Because, plus, I don't have my my pieces, my work piece, not the waist side. The waist is in the trap side of the of the blade, the narrow side of the blade. So Ex it actually, it actually leads for a better cut. You don't get as much burning, and you get a more precise cut too. Exactly. That's okay. that's part of my point. Yeah. Okay. Because somebody has tipped it to the left, and if you notice the left sort of the adjustable fence um uh, somebody's cut it off at 45 degrees at some point <laughs> you're kidding no but yeah okay you're you know to the right yeah okay so and then so you move it move it to the slot and then you have to move the fence right because the yeah the fence mostly on the other side and yeah, then yeah so if we can instruct anyone that we can see on on doing it that way um also, we're saving. It will saving be saving blades and yeah. and cartridges. I would also recommend that uh, uh, a lot of times somebody wants to change the blade. They want to go to a dado stack or whatever. Um, fine, you know, yeah, uh, but don't let the the shift supervisor should not let the person do that on their own. They can do they can do it. Shift supervisor should observe them and they should change it back. And, and paying particular attention to calibrating the brake to the blade. Because I have caught several people who
who they just want to use a different blade. They want to go from one ten. They one guy complained that this the, the tens blade that was in there was dull and it was burning a cut, and he wanted to know if he could get a sharper blade. And so I said, sure. So we get a sharper blade, and I said, you know how to change the blade? He said, yeah. And I said, okay, show me. And so he got in there, he changed the blade, and he never even bothered to check the calibration of the break distance from the blade. So a lot of people, maybe they're, they've used a table saw before, and they understand how to change a blade, but they're not into the intricacies of the saw stop and the uh, break calibration. Uh, and so we just need to make sure that that is uh, uh, covered. So if there is ever a blade change, whether a blade to another blade or a blade to a dado and back, ship supervisor should observe that if they're going to let the member change the blade or it should be checked off that the break is calibrated correctly. Yeah, definitely. The other thing is a dull blade may not be dull, it may just be dirty. Yep. Yeah, yeah, that's. I ran across one of those the other day. Hey, Rick, um, I got yes. a quick question for you and or Dallas. Um, have we, to my knowledge, I don't think I can remember any of these, but in recent history, have we ever had uh, any kickback incidents? I'm not aware of any. Not that I've ever observed or heard about. That's terrific. And I wonder why that is. Raving knife. Raving knife. Yeah. And I think our shift supervisor has really been good about paying attention to technique. You know, there's, even with oh. a rifle knife, you can sure fire off a, have, oh, yeah. a have a kickback. But oh yeah, I mean, it, yeah. But that's good. That's good. Yeah. When we oh. certainly emphasize it in every of the every one of the intro classes. It's a big deal to in that class. Mm -hmm. Okay, one thing, I, I, one point I would like to make, and I've observed this on some videos, that when you're cutting sheet goods, and I've seen people um, sort of try to stay clear of the, the, the right side of the blade where the, the cut up, the, where you're cutting the sheet goods against the fence, and they're using a stick and they re get awkward posture versus just putting both hands on that sheet goods and pushing it through. You know, you end up with like trying to stay out of the kickback zone. Well, that's not really a problem with sheet goods. So just think about that a little bit once in a while. Cause I've seen some really awkward postures on the videos and people are trying to stay out of the kickback zone. So, but, uh, so anyway. I, I've got another, another issue with kickbacks I've seen many, many people, particularly newer people, that take the push stick and they, they put it against the rip fence, fence yeah. which is going to direct the wood into the blade to potentially yeah. cause a kickback. So um, I, I don't think I've had a shop shift where I didn't have at least one person I've had to, you know, correct yeah. them on that. Yeah. Hey, I'm going to go get a... I'm going to step out for just one minute because I've got to get a charger. My computer's going low, so I'll okay, be. I'm going, to, I'm going to step into a couple other items, and we're going to wrap up the meeting. Okay. Yeah, I want to talk about the router thing or the. Okay. Well, yeah. okay. well he stepped out. I'll just give you a couple other quick, uh, quick items. First of all, uh, uh, as we mentioned in the earlier, we're working on a, a uh, revision to our introduction to woodworking class. One of the things we're trying to do is set up some, uh, a series of short videos that we'd have the students watch before the, the class. If you're aware of anyone who in the shop who might volunteer to help us make videos and has that capacity, uh, I'd like to, sure look like to have my, have knowledge of them and, uh, and see if we can recruit them to, to help make that happen. Um, The second thing is, uh, well, Rick's back now, so go ahead, Rick. Okay, um, this is a safety item, and Jeff Bratt wanted to be on this call, but he's traveling and couldn't. And um, I'm, I'm going to read what he put in the shop log, and then talk about uh, what what we asked to happen, and maybe get some discussion. Um, this is, you know, verbatim. 
uh, with le less the member's name from Jeff. I had an issue with a member. I was helping him with a his box uh, box joint fixture, which he had used be here before. I cautioned him earlier about getting too close to the cutter when brushing away chips and sawdust. But on the very last cut, the spinning router bit nicked his fingertip. The result was a minor injury requiring just band first aid. Band-aids su sufficed to fix him. I guess I. I have to be a little more adamant about saying staying three inches away from a blade at all times. Um, the experienced woodworker is just being too casual about the risk. Um, shift supervisor noticed it, but it was a little timid about being too pushy. Um, when you see things like this, uh, stop what's happening, talk to the member for a minute or two, discuss that, make sure they realize the danger they're putting themselves in, and then keep a close eye on them. If the member doesn't change immediately, ask them to stop what they're doing to stay safe, because your focus is their safety. It's not being heavy handed or that it's, it's really their safety and, and if they don't or don't want to do comply uh, refer them ask them to stop their project refer them to Dallas myself Sharon so we can reinforce you know the that because it's, it's easy sometimes to not want to be rude or too pushy but you know now, this one was as close as you get to a near miss, a major problem. So, yeah. Rick, Rick can you hear me? Yes. Do you, want, do you want me to put some kind of uh, like red lines on the router table? No, no. Okay. No, okay. no, there's, it's not that black and white. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, Dallas or others? No, you know, this is, this just goes along with it. The, I think there's some broader issues here that we need to learn about. Uh, there's a few members that uh, that start moving their hands before they engage their brain. And I think we it seems to be the same people doing the same things. And we so we're going to have to figure out a way to deal with a, a handful of them. But I urge you as shift supervisors, not only to take this very seriously, uh, paying attention to what people do, but let's pass on amongst ourselves what the near misses were, what the what the opportunities and what the learning is, because we cannot uh, put ourselves in a position where we where we have a uh, an accident that that could put us that could really set back the shop, and just because we have we can't allow just one or two members to destroy something we've got here that's very special, uh, that there's just too much at risk, so you have to be the ones to to take the lead and uh, take the hard action on there. That's, uh, but it's for the benefit of all of us. And I ask you to take that very seriously. Don't be afraid to, to buck that up to Gary or to me or to Sharon or Rick. And we're happy to deal with them separately, but you've got to deal with the immediate risk. Okay. Hey guys, we've got a long time here. We've got an hour and 45 minutes. Um, I want to finish up by saying how much I appreciate what you what you do and what you've done. Uh, we probably need to have these meetings uh, a little more frequently, but have them keep them shorter. There's so much content we'd like to have. Mary's yawning right now. <laughs> <laughs> Just think about how long the meeting has been. Uh, there's a message for me. Uh, uh, one last thing I do want to say is. Uh, or asked for is we have wanted to get, I've been wanting Gary and I've been talking about getting all the, the active shift supervisors, uh, uh, some, a, a, a nice uh, shop apron or a, a shop smock or something that would be a vest. It would help designate everybody as a shift supervisor, but something that's really nice. We want something that makes it a, a good experience in the shop, place you can put the phone, place your tools, uh, something you could use uh, in other, other places. I haven't been able to find one. 
Tom called because he's been looking for me. He's found one that's a possibility. Uh, Gary spent some time looking. We haven't found it. I'd like to have one or two uh, people step up and and help out with this. Help Tom and I uh, uh, find the, the right one. Uh, we want to find some things that work that really do the job well. I have a lot of preferences what I like to work in. I want something over my pockets. I don't want to fill my pockets with chips. Um, I, I like a good place for pencils. Other people have other other preferences, but I'd like to find one that we we can uh, we'd be proud to wear and be happy to wear, and uh, I'd like some help with that. So if one or two of you would contact me after the meeting, I'd appreciate it. I think this would be a really nice thing, and I think we'd all like to have them if we if we could find the right one. Okay. Thank you. You've held in with me for an hour and 45 minutes. That's a long time. Uh, I do intend to start doing these more frequently, but make them shorter. Uh, there are some uh, uh, agenda items I think we just got to stay together with and keep everybody updated. Uh, there's just no way that we can do that coming into the shop, particularly during COVID, but uh, we can do it with the technology we have available to us today. So. Any last words, Rick? No, no, it's Karen, anything? No. Nope. Okay, Gary? Just thank you again to all of you. You're doing a great job. We appreciate it. Okay, guys. Thank you. Thanks, Karen. Thank you.